Hello, you're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, will cuts to the UK's foreign aid budget undermine climate discussions at COP26? The cost of climate change laid bare as new research puts a price on how much G7 countries could pay if they don't do more to tackle the climate crisis. And how a frozen food company is making farming more sustainable one potato field at a time. Hello there and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those who are coming up with the solutions. And we start today with concerns that a cut to the UK's foreign aid budget will undermine the country's presidency of a key climate summit. COP26, as you know, takes place in Glasgow in November and a central part of the meeting will, of course, be climate finance. Money from richer countries to help developing nations adapt to the impacts of climate change. But the government is facing increasing criticism of a decision to cut foreign aid spending, which includes climate projects. That's from 0.7% of gross national income down to 0.5%. Well, back in 2019, Boris Johnson announced that the UK would spend at least £11.6 billion on international climate finance. That's between 2021 and 2026. Well, the Foreign Office says that this year more than £500 million will be spent on the climate and biodiversity portfolio. And according to the government, between 2011 and 2020, international climate finance programmes have supported 66 million people to cope with the effects of climate change. Well, that includes helping farmers to grow crops that can adapt to changing weather conditions, improving irrigation systems and strengthening defences against floods and storms. Well, around 33 million people have been provided with improved access to clean energy, for example, more efficient cooking stoves, to reduce indoor air pollution from open fires. But will this be enough to convince the critics? Well, with me now is our foreign affairs editor, Deborah Haynes. Uh, Deborah, the optics of this aren't great. Are they ahead of COP26 when the UK government is going to be encouraging other nations to pony up cash for climate change? Yes, and the government is pushing back against this obvious criticism, saying that it has tried to protect funding for initiatives that are related to climate change, because clearly it is one of the government's core priorities. But ahead of COP26, ahead too of the G7 summit this week, there's, there's huge criticism of the government about these cuts, not only because it has an indirect effect on the battle to combat climate change, because it reduces resources in the poorest nations for climate action, but it also sends exactly the wrong message when the government is trying to get other countries to cough up and pay more, it's cutting its own budget. All right, Deborah, thank you. Well, let's take a look now at today's other climate news. And if you fancy a change to your commute, then you could well be in luck. Electric scooters are now available to rent in some parts of London as part of a 12-month trial. They're limited, though, to 12 and a half miles per hour, and riders must be 18 or over. Research suggests that rental e-scooters are better for the environment than cars, resulting in approximately half of the CO2 emissions. Will Norman is London's walking and cycling commissioner. We know that every day in London, four and a half million car journeys are driven for less than two kilometres. So the challenge is, how can we switch people from using those local car journeys to walking, cycling, public transport? And this trial is looking at, well, what role can e-scooters play in complementing those modes? Almost a quarter of all land mammals and butterfly species are at risk in Cornwall. That's according to the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, who've warned that 12% of species of principal importance are threatened with local extinction. They found that intensive farming and climate change are among the biggest threats to the county, while sea fishing and pollution are also significant issues. Also bad news for the African great apes. They're predicted to lose 90% of their habitats by 2050. The study, published in the journal Diversity and Distributions, found that climate change will 
cause the fruit and plants that gorillas, chimpanzees and bonobos eat to grow elsewhere. Because great apes reproduce slowly, they have specific diets, scientists say that 30 years isn't enough time for them to migrate and find new habitats. Now, the economies of G7 nations could see a huge hit every year if they do not commit to tackling climate change. That is according to new research, which suggests the climate crisis could shrink economies by twice as much as the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, analysis from Oxfam and the Swiss Re-Institute shows that on average, GDP of G7 countries will decrease by 8.5% a year by 2050. That is equivalent to almost 3.4 trillion pounds. However, that is based on the most drastic prediction of a global rise in temperature of 2.6 degrees. Well, here is the effect on each of the G7 nations. The UK is actually the least impacted, projected to lose up to 6.5% still of GDP. Look at Italy, though, 11.4% and France coming in at 10%. Both countries have no new national level climate commitments beyond the general EU target of a reduction of 55% from 1990 levels by the end of the decade. Well, to put the G7 nations into context, you can see here how they compare to India, a 27% hit to its economy, the Philippines down 35%. Well, we can bring in here Nafkote Darby, Climate Policy Lead at Oxfam. A good afternoon to you, uh, Nafkote. And the bottom line, isn't it, that even with the climate pledges that we've had so far on reducing emissions, climate change is going to take a big hit to economies around the world. Thanks so much, Samantha. That was a great summary. Uh, I would not say, you know, the climate plans that we have right now are ambitious. We're way off track from what is needed actually uh, to limit uh, warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So we have less than nine years to reduce emissions by half and collectively, you know, globally, we need to reduce emissions by half by 2030. And again, we're way off track. Current climate plans, current climate policies uh, fall way below that uh, from what is needed to reduce, uh, I mean, to limit warming to 1.5. So 1.5 is what's considered to be safer to the world. So actually, you know, the climate ambition right now is not uh, to what is needed to limit warming to 1.5. And this is why it's really critical at this summit, G7 countries need to take the lead, especially as, you know, they're responsible uh, for historical emissions. So they need to take the lead to reduce emissions faster and deeper. Yeah, let me ask you about that, Navkate, because uh, the climate finance that was promised by richer nations more than 10 years ago hasn't materialised, has it? G7 countries or wealthy countries uh, are falling short of, you know, the 100 billion commitment. Uh, as of now, uh, you know, we think around 80% uh, of the funding has been met. Uh, but there's more that needs to be done. And this finance is not enough to uh, what is needed to support especially communities that are highly vulnerable uh, to the climate crisis. So more needs to be done. All right. Well, we'll have to wait and see, won't we, Navkate Darby? Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. Farming is often criticised when it comes to climate change. Land is cleared to plant crops, greenhouse gas emissions are produced by livestock and fertilisers can cause environmental damage. But one company trying to make a difference is McCain Foods. The frozen potato company has committed to improving their farming practices by using 100% regenerative farming by 2030. Well, here is how that works.
Well, that's how it all works. We can talk more about it now with Daniel Metheringham, the Vice President of Agriculture at McCain. Afternoon to you, Daniel. This is a big change in the way that you're going to do business. What prompted it? What prompted it? I think this year is an absolutely crucial year uh, for farming, um, government, um, and also all of our, our, our farmers and business. And what we've decided to do is make a real ambitious pledge uh, to move all of our farmers to 100% regenerative practices by 2030. And that is globally. So we really are trying to set the bar high. And a firm of your size, your global, how do you monitor these commitments across thousands of farms in six continents? Yeah, look, we work on a global scale uh, and we have a global agriculture programme that we uh, basically work, work towards. And part of that is actually by leveraging what we're announcing also is operating three farms of the futures by 2025. And what these will be are basically knowledge transfer hubs uh, for all of our farmers and customers uh, to basically go on and see these practices in, in hand and then look at how we're monitoring using technology to leverage that data so then we can basically improve the soils um, and, and basically increase biodiversity and reduce greenhouse gases. Now, we all know there's a pretty tight margin in the modest old potato, uh, Daniel, and farmers have had a tough year, as you say. Are consumers going to end up paying more for their fries? Um, I think... It's difficult to say about the, the, the total value, but this is about building resilience in, into the businesses. So uh, McCain is a family-owned business. Um, it, it was founded by farmers. Um, and basically what we've seen over the last few years is greater volatility in the potato market. So, and the climate extremes we've been experiencing has been really impacting both McCain and the farmer. So building it in that resilience, I think the, the cost uh, element that will actually stabilise and create uh, a stable environment to work in. All right, uh, Daniel, really good to talk to you. Thank you for your time on Sky News. Thank you. Well, that is everything from us for today. Join us tomorrow, though, when we've got special coverage of World Ocean Day, including the fishermen who are being taught how to remove plastic from the Mediterranean Sea. That's at the same time tomorrow here, of course, on Sky News. Hope to see you then.